Good morning, everyone. And happy Sabbath. So I'm the guy to bring in if uh, any pastor needs help. So yeah, I'm here to share a message. Now, unfortunately, um, I, this is kind of, I won't say a recycled message. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to give you a recycled message because this is a message that I shared before. And the amount of time that I had to prepare this, uh, prepare something, it took me a while because um, I'm a chaplain as well for a school in Auburn. And it was, uh, it was really busy because it's the second last week for the school, for the term. And I had to organize, um, had to organize the, uh, the graduation for the year six students going into high school. And it's just been a, a, a quite of a busy day. And um, so I kind of think of it like, I, I did make some adjustments and changes to this message. So just think of it like, uh, it's a 2.0. It's kind of like a, it's, it's modified for you. So don't think of it that it's, don't think of it as like recycled. It's uh, unique for you guys, all right? So I've adjusted it and made it so it's special for you. Um, do we have any children? I'm guessing we've got some children at home. We've got a couple of children here. Um, I like to draw. And uh, as, a, as a chaplain for a primary school, I do a lot of drawings for the kids. And they're like really fascinated. I do a little stick figures. They're like, oh, is that you, Pastor Fabian? And I'm like, no, it's not. Just focus on the story. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a drawing. Now, I know for some people at home, um, yeah, I just got to be reminded to draw big. Because usually I like to draw little tiny things. So it makes a little kid squint. But uh, I'll draw something big. And uh, it's kind of like a children's story that I want to share to you. So first things first, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's like a big chasm. I'm just going to draw a, a big chasm and... On one side, we've got us, all right? So here we are, we've got us, and over here, we've got God, all right? And uh, God <clears throat> saw this uh, big hole right here. Now, he could have filled it up. He could have said, you know what? Let there be land, and there we go. Land is there. No, God had a better idea. He sent to these guys some, like, kind of like a, a plans and instructions. He sent to us plans and instructions to build a bridge. He wanted us to build a bridge, a bridge that will connect us with God. So us, we, we all just, um, we got involved and we decided to, get the bridge, uh, to build that bridge. So I'll write down, I'll draw here the instructions, da, 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 and oh, make a hammer so it kind of, does it look like a hammer? I think it looks like a hammer. So he gave us instructions and a plan, and we built the bridge. Like this. It was a mighty bridge, uh, so to say. I'm not an engineer, but uh, I guess like something like this looks good. And then you've got ropes here, and ropes there, and ropes that connect here, and ropes that connect there. It's a, it's a good bridge. Yeah, I'm not a good engineer, so I don't know if that's going to work. But a bridge, nonetheless. So we were happy. There was a connection between us and God from the plans that he, that he gave us. So we were all happy. We decided to build towns next to it. We were like, we were so, so happy. And God was happy too. He's, i got to draw his kingdom. Yeah, something that looks like that. And he was very, very happy. We were all happy. But then later on in life, we decided, you know what? I think we need to make some adjustments to that bridge. I mean, that bridge, although it's perfect, I think... We can make it bigger. I guess we can modify it in some way. So we, like all of us, like any type of humans, we like to make modifications. I know for me, um, whenever I design something, you're always not happy with that design. So you like to make little kinks, little changes. And then eventually, as you make those changes, what happens to the bridge? Kapush! It goes down. It, you know, we... we, we, we we changed it, we modified it too much to the point that it wasn't structurally sound and it collapsed. Oh, and then, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people fell down and like, oh no, the bridge, it's not stable. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we made a modification to the bridge. We, the modification made the bridge unstable and a lot of people fell down. Sad story. So, People were kind of upset, they were sad, and they decided, you know what, 
Why, why did we make some modifications? Why did we need to make any modification to that perfect bridge? It was good. It was okay. What are we doing? Let's go back and make that bridge again, okay? Let's, fi let's find those old plans. Let's find those instructions. So they found the plans. They found the instructions. They built the bridge again. Here we go. There's the bridge. Oh, okay, so there was a pylon here, and there was a pylon here, and there's ropes here, and there's ropes there, ropes there, and ropes there. Everyone is happy. Now we've got a new connection to the bridge. All right, after a while, guess what we did? We modified it. But this time we thought that, um, yeah, maybe there was a, a few things that we can add to it. Uh, let's, add, let's add a tollway. Yes. You know, this bridge, need, it's, it, we need, it's hard to maintain. We need to add a tollway. So let's add more structures. And then after a while, people, you know, started crowding the bridge and, you know, this tollway. We decided to build some offices. We put a, another building here, another building there. And uh, a lot of people put little shops here, you know, just to, uh, just to help out, you know, make, thrive the business, you know. And as a result, because of the, the amount of weight that was on the bridge, what happened? Kaput! Yes! Down it went, and all the people like, ah, help us, we're falling! Whatever, okay? Don't worry, these guys just fall into a, a water and they just get back up and fine, okay? So there's, no one gets hurt, all right? It's just a fun, fun ride, all right? So, yes, the bridge collapses as a result of all the weight, and then everyone sings, London Bridge is falling down, all right? or this particular bridge is falling down. So everyone collapses and falls. So what do you reckon? What happens next? Okay, hum humanity has failed twice. So God, on the other hand, is like, oh, these guys just don't understand how to make this bridge. All right, let me do this. Let me, let me go over to the other side. Okay, let me go wee over to the other side. And I'm gonna tell them how to make this bridge. All right, stop modifying it, just make it simple. So. God sends a, a person by the name of Jesus, okay? God kind of sends himself, and he's like, guys, what are you guys doing? You've got the instructions. You've got the plans. Just build it. What do you reckon the people do? They're like, nah, you're silly. Nah, that's not you. Do it, no. Get out of here. You know, it's kind of like the, what we have in Australia, what we call the tall poppy syndrome, where some guy comes up and tries to teach these guys, and, and just like um, anyone that stands up, or uh, tries to make a name of it for themselves, they're like, they just, well, they just cut him down. It's like, nah, get out of here. So they kick him out. And he, he gets ejected. No one wants him. No one wants, to, wants him to, yeah, no one wants his plans. No one wants his, uh, uh, his ideas to connect the bridge. Because I guess like for, for these guys, they failed, you know, twice. Why do we need to build another bridge? Just... We're happy, we're contented with what we have. Okay, yeah, we've got the instructions, we've got, we've got the plans. There's no need for us to, to build another bridge. We're, we're sick and tired of people falling down into the water and we're going to have to go rescue them. So, Jesus decides, you know what, I'm going to make a bridge, but I'm going to make a bridge that's invisible. So, I'm going to make an invisible bridge. And the only way you can cross this bridge is by faith. So, no one can see this. No one can see this at all. But this bridge can still be accessed. And the only way to get to the other side is by faith. So it's like coming to the edge. And it's like, okay, I believe in you, Jesus. Close your eyes and just step, step forth. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to jump. <laughs> but it's like just crossing and stepping. And then once the, the person who believes actually has that first step, they move on in faith, crossing and making their way forward to the kingdom of God. So all these people here are walking out in faith because they believe and know that there is a structure there, a bridge that will support them. And uh, while these people here are happy and contented for what they have, these people here are looking forward to a better, better kingdom, a better place. So kids and everyone else here, this is the story of the bridge. And I want us to realize that there is a bridge that God has created, and that is a bridge that we can journey on by faith. So, kids, that's something to learn, and I hope that we're, we, can, we can all make that journey, okay? No matter what size you are, whether big or small, whether old or young, 
We can all make that journey by faith. So, that's my children's story. And now it comes to the adults. I'm going to share a message to the adults. But before I begin, how about we start with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, I'd just like to thank you for this, uh, this moment in time that I can come here to speak to your congregation, to your people. And Lord, Father in heaven, I pray that you will speak through me. Um, I know that this is a message that I've, uh, that I've preached before, but Lord, uh, I pray that this is the message that, this is, that is suitable for your, uh, your people here. And I ask and pray that you will inspire me and speak through me, that you help me, Father in heaven, to, to speak your words. Uh, I just pray and ask, Lord, that, um, that everyone here will have the hearts open to realize and know, Lord, how we can spend, um, well, spend our lives here on this earth with you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so as you kind of understand what I'm trying to get out from this particular point, when we think about the, the plans and instructions, well, in this particular case, the instructions that, are, that I was presenting here was the instructions that we can find in the Bible. All right, God has instructions on how we can, well, basic instructions before leaving earth, the B-I-B-L-E, right? And uh, I think about this whole concept about... Uh, these plans, what plans did God have? And I think about the, the well, God's plan of salvation, the God's GPS, so to say. But I'm going to take us to a verse found in the Bible, and it's found in, in, in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 to 9. Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 to 9. And when it talks about a sanctuary, a sanctuary that God gave to, well, to the Hebrew people. And we find it here. In Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 to 9, and he says here, well, God is talking to, to Moses here, and he says here, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I show you. You know, <clears throat> the world presumes that God is, you know, distant. Like we think God is far away. He doesn't. He doesn't do anything. He's just there just to govern the universe. And for us, a little speck of the universe, we're nothing. There's no yeah, God. You know, this is what the world kind of believes and thinks. Humanity is just but a speck of the, of the universe. They, 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 they kind of think of him that he's smirking up there. He's, he's just smirking at humanity as they falter and fall and watch and, and they, they think, humanity thinks of God as someone who just casts judgment. Lightning there, lightning here, just condemning sinners. And it's, it's a sad picture when they really, I mean, it's like as if they don't see who Jesus is or Jesus never existed. But when I read the verse here, when I read this particular verse, in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 to 9, it, it shows to us that, what well, it shows to God's intimacy to us, how God, the Creator, of heaven and earth, wants to dwell amongst us, wants to be with his people. Now, to give you an idea, when, he, when God was, was telling this message to the children of Israel, Israel, where were they? They were in the wilderness. They were out, they were out there lost. Well, I won't say lost. God was with them. They were out there in the, uh, in, in the wilderness. God could go to any established kingdom, any nation. But he went to, to the Israelites. And he was there. He took them out of Egypt and said to them that he wanted to be there. He wanted to dwell amongst them. He wanted to be with them. He wanted to be intimate and personal. And now think about the, this, this whole concept of the sanctuary and what it means. Uh, uh, just something that, I, that comes to mind when I look at King David. King David says in Psalms 27 verse 4, The one thing, the one thing I ask of the Lord. The thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. The king, well, this great king who established the, the kingdom of Israel would rather be in the kingdom of God, would rather be in his temple to meditate, to look and think upon uh, of, on, the, on the perfections of God. So the subject, of course, is the sanctuary, and it's a very interesting subject. 
Um, one that should be studied in full, but of course I don't have a lot of time. I mean, I can go on and on about the sanctuary, but I'm sorry. I know you guys might want to, want to eat, want to have, uh, uh, I don't want to take, I don't want to overtake your lunch time, but uh, I will hopefully feed you spiritually as we go into this concept of the sanctuary. Now, for some of us, we know what the sanctuary looks like and how it looks like, but you know what? I'm going to draw it for you guys because I've got the whiteboard here for a reason. So here we are. Of course, we need to rub all this off. Now, first things first, when we think about the sanctuary, what do we have? What is the first thing that you see? We have, I'm going to draw big two. Okay. We have, I'll make this a bit bigger. We have what we call the outer court. Yes. So I'll write that down so people can see, even people at home, the outer court. Okay? So here we have the outer court. Now, here, what do we find? There are two particular objects, right? First object is, yeah, the brazen altar. All right? So this is where, oh, I'll, I'll elaborate a bit more um, later. And then we also got the, the brazen laver. Uh, size, don't worry about the size. I know I made a mistake, but that's all good. All right, give you an idea what it looks like. So to give you a, an understanding, the people that were here um, were the, um, the sinner who will bring their sacrifice to the Lord. They will come here with their sacrifice, their animal sacrifice, lay their hands on the sacrifice, transferring their sins on the, the animal, and, um, yeah, the, the throat of the animal would be slit. The blood would be drained, usually in, uh, depending on the sin, uh, but it will be put into a particular bowl. Um, and, of course, the animal will, will, will die. Eventually, the priest will take the animal. And I won't be too graphic, but, yeah, it will be put, on the, uh, put onto the, the altar uh, to be burnt. So, yeah, um, I'll draw an animal. There we go. Yeah. Looks like a cat, but it doesn't matter. It's not meant to look like a cat. It's just meant to be a sacrifice. Okay? So, but yes, it um, is uh, um, the, eventually the, the sacrifice is burnt onto the altar to signify yeah, the eradication of sin. The eradication of sin. Now, the priests who are performing and doing all this, of course, um, they clean their hands, they clean their feet, um, they clean themselves through the, the labor. And the priests themselves, before they can enter into the next particular part compartment, which is what we have here, um, we have what we call the, what's this place called again? The holy place. It's good to see some people know what it is. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll put down MHP. Okay. We know what that one is. And in here, the priests... Um, the priest and the high priest were allowed to be in here. So no one, of course, no, um, no, one, no commoner or no Israelite was only, uh, allowed to be, enter into here, only for the priest and the, holy, uh, and the high priest, of course. And here we've got, on this side, we've got the table of showbread, okay? And this, of course, the bread was uh, this 12, uh, 12 showbread representing the tribe of Israel. Good, good. We have the seven branch candlestick. See if I can do this. Yep. Okay, light here. And this is what we call the menorah. And then over here we've got the what do we call this, guys? Incense. Yeah, we've got the incense there. Yeah, the altar of incense. And obviously, this is the holy place, and then we've got the most holy place, which has the the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, yeah. Covenant looks like this. And then inside the Ark of the Covenant, you've got the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and the pot of manna. Yeah, that looks good, right? Give you an idea. So this is a Fabian's version of the, uh, uh, of the, of the sanctuary. And this is, again, this is something that I'll, be, that I'll be going through. Now, how does this all, why am I talking about this? What's this all meant to be about? Well, this was what God had asked the children of Israel to build. This was God dwelling with his people. This was God being with his people, being personal. Being, being intimate, 
And how all this, when we look at all this, everything that we see here all points to Jesus. Everything that we see here all points to his ministry on this earth. From the sacrifice, to baptism, to the menorah, showbread, and the altar of incense, even the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant. Everything that we see here all points to Jesus. Now, I can go on and on about how it all points to Jesus, um, but that's a, lot, that's a lot to go through. And again, I still don't have time to go through because we can go here until sunset and to look at this, to really explore this, it's a beautiful message. It is a beautiful message and how God is trying to, read, well, God's plan for salvation for us. God's plan of salvation for all of us. And I, I don't know if you guys have gone through this, uh, this message before. I'm guessing you guys have gone through this message. But I like to look at it from another perspective. And um, yeah, when we look at this concept of the, the sanctuary, it was a mobile, kind of mobile tent. Again, God came to them. God wanted them to build it while they were in the wilderness. He didn't ask for them to build like a, a, a big structure, a grand structure. He wanted something that, was, that started off simple. And eventually, from there, as the children of Israel settled, in the, uh, settled into Canaan, into, into Jerusalem, uh, eventually King Solomon, King David's son, later on built the, uh, yeah, the, the temple. And uh, that temple was seen to be the, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But because of the rebellion of, of God's people, after many generations, what happened to that temple? It was, yeah, it was destroyed by the Babylonians. And eventually it was reconstructed, uh, but it was later reconstructed during the Persian Empire, and Herod later uh, reconstructed it. But again, that was destroyed in 70 AD. So that was like one, about 1,950 years ago the temple was destroyed. And What's, what's there now? Yeah, the Dome of the Rock, Islam's third holiest place. So where is the sanctuary then? Has God abandoned us? Are we, are we left to deal with the, with, with the world on our own? I mean, we're all doomed then, if that's the case. Now, while the physical building, this physical structure, was destroyed, again, 1,950 years ago, we need to go back to the Bible and figure out, is there still a chance for us to have that union, that relationship with God? And of course, yes, the answer that we can find is through Jesus. But there's, well, let's kind of extrapolate that. Let's try to get an understanding of that. Um, let's try to get that understanding through the concept of the sanctuary. Because there's still yet another sanctuary. Something that we should, you know, something that should be sought after still. Now, we understand that... <clears throat> The sanctuary was a place that God wanted to dwell and settle with his people, wanted to settle with us. It was a holy structure, an important structure that pointed to Jesus. And, of course, this structure also points not only, well, not only to Jesus, but also it showed to us what Jesus' ministry is. All that, of course, was fulfilled when Jesus came to this world and that he died for our sins. We know that at his death, that Jesus, um, at, at his death, um, uh, the Gospels record that the curtain that separated the holy place and the most holy place was, was ripped, okay? So when Jesus died, the curtain was ripped, representing God no longer in the presence, or no longer in that, uh, in that temple. God has exited when Jesus died. So everything, of course, pointed to Jesus. And, um, yeah, it declared that the sanctuary service to be kind of fulfilled through Christ at his death. And that all will be made right, uh, right with God. And that, yeah, the animal sacrifices will, be, will, will no longer be needed. Imagine if we had to do that to this day. Uh, if we had to, imagine trying to bring someone to church. Hey, guys, want to come to church? Oh, Bring your animal with you. you know? Oh, you don't have one? Oh, don't worry. We, we, we could sort that out for you. All right. And then you just, <laughs> you just imagine someone who just, um, who hasn't experienced church at all. Oh, yeah. So what you got to do, place your hands upon the animal, share your sins, and then just slit the throat. 
kind of a graphic picture, and I don't think that um, I don't think many of us would be too fond in going to church if that's the case. It's kind of a scary, and we, and that's the reason why when we look to Jesus, we, we you know, we are so thankful for what He had done for us that we no longer have to do that because Jesus has taken that. He, Jesus has taken the place of the, of the of the sacrifice. But is Christ's ministry complete? Is it finished? Yeah, when um, Pastor Wellington was sharing, was praying, he kind of shared the, the message through the prayer. I was like, could you just stop a bit more? No. <laughs> you just kind of, you just kind of ruined my, no. But you understand that Jesus, <laughs> that Jesus is, is at a place, he's in a place right now where he's representing us, he's interceding for us, he's, he's mediating for us. So then when I think of that, when we think about this whole concept where Jesus is mediating, well, I think about what the person, the one person that was only allowed to go into the most holy place. We think about what Jesus, who Jesus is. And I want us to, uh, I want us to go through a, a particular chapter. Uh, we're going to go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. And I want us to realize this is something that makes us distinct. We as Adventists, that makes us distinct from various denominations. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says to us, so then, since we have a great, a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. The high priest of, our, of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And it tells us here that Christ is our high priest. And what is the, what is the, what is the role of the high priest? Well, that's something I wanna, gonna, I'm going to talk about a bit later. But... Jesus is representing us. He is our high priest. The high priest was the one that kind of, yeah, represented the, the children of Israel before God. And, um, and, yeah, that's what Jesus is doing right now. But the thing is I would like to bring out here is this part, right? Where it says here, the high priest of, our, of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do. Now, when I think about this verse, what does that mean? How has Jesus ever faced the, the same testings or understandings that we've gone through? Well, has Jesus ever, let's say, for example, has, has Jesus ever faced drug abuse? I mean, has Jesus ever faced uh, pornography? Or has he ever faced, you know, what, you know, not having Wi-Fi at home? What's a Wi-Fi password? Has he ever faced that? Has he ever faced, you know, um, a global pandemic? Or, you know, in the shops not having toilet paper? Or, you know, ravaging bushfires. Has God ever experienced that? Has, has Jesus ever experienced that? Well, of course, in some way, in some degree. Uh, I think about what, um, in the time of Jesus, there was no censorship in his time. And when we think about the Greeks, or the Romans, and the statues, or even the, the, the prostitutes in that time, it was, it was all for everyone to see. Jesus faced all that. And the Bible tells us he did not sin, yet did not sin, which makes him a, 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 a candidate, a, an example for all of us, um, not only an example for all of us, but he makes him a, yeah, a, well, uh, a candidate for us for, for him being our high priest. He was one of us. He was our brethren. And he faced all temptations and, and suffering and yet still loves us and died for us and gave his life for us. He faced all that. And it doesn't matter what period or age, Jesus faced it, in, fa faced it during his ministry here on earth. And through that various temptation he experienced on earth, yet he did not sin and is our high priest. So when we think about Jesus, or actually before we go there, yeah, when we think about Jesus, what is the role of the high priest? So, so let's turn to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 or 2. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 or 2. And it tells us here, here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in a place of honor beside the throne of, uh, throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in, in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. We find where Jesus is located at. As Pastor Wellington shared through the prayer, Jesus is right now representing us before God. 
because he had, su he had suffered, he had faced all, all, well, all the trials that, um, that we face, yet he did not sin. Jesus is located in a heavenly sanctuary, in a heavenly tabernacle, which is another fancy name for a sanctuary that is built, without, uh, that is built not by human hands, but by God. When we look at Hebrews chapter 9, um, you don't have to go through that, uh, we find an earthly sanctuary, the one the Israelites worshipped, was only a copy. And if you look at verse 24 of Hebrews 9, it says, For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into, um, he entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And again, this is what makes our, our message, our Adventist message unique. You know, Christ is not up there just watching us, you know, parading or, or, or whatever. Christ is there interceding for us on our behalf. And when we think about, when, when we think about, the, um, when we think about the, the high priest, when um, the children of Israel, at the time of, um, when, when they had to make an atonement, um, with the children of Israel did not make, um, weren't properly right with God, what happens to the high priest? So think of that when, whenever, whenever we go through, you know, I know it's tough for us in life, but we can always get through it whenever we, we face our trials. And when we fail, don't give up. Right? When we fail, don't give up. Yeah, God will still always be there for us. And when we think about, when we think about this whole concept about God um, in, in creating a sanctuary, a sanctuary for the children of Israel, a place where he can dwell with them. And we think about this, this whole concept of this copy in verse 24 of chapter 9, that, that, that um, the sanctuary that's on earth is only a copy of what you find in heaven. It's as if God had to move his home, his place of comfort, to be with us sinners. Uh, let me give you an idea of how that works. It's like, uh, for those of you who don't know who my wife is, my wife, she is uh, Mongolian of Chinese, uh, uh, of, she, uh, who, who comes from China. And um, she came to Australia, not to find me. Uh, she came to Australia to study. But uh, she eventually found me and my good looks and my charm. Kind of swayed her here to, to stay in Australia. But she had to give up everything. She had to give up her home, a comfort, just to be here. And uh, when I think about this, uh, what she had done, the sacrifice that she had to go through to leave her home to be here, you know, it kind of makes me, um, yeah, well, it's kind of, yeah, it is emotional to, to really think of that. You know, she had to give so much, and um, she had to give so much for, for me so she could stay here. Um, it kind of really makes me appreciate what she has done. And to think what God had done, the God of the universe, the cre our creator, left his comfort, his home, to be amongst us, in the wilderness, in the desert, to be with those people who would murmur, who would rebel. God knew all this, yet he still wanted to be there with them. With them. And then when Christ came, to be amongst the people who didn't know that he was going to come. And uh, for, for a people that was going to kill him, he still came. It gives us a, a better sense of appreciation of the, of the sacrifice that, that God had to go through just to dwell with his people. It gives us an idea, you know, when we put that all into perspective, that Christ would come to a rebellious people. He gave up so much. And yet still he loves us, even though we rejected him. And it kind of makes us think, you know, God, God was still with us. God was still with them, and he never gave up on them. And then why do you think that God will ever abandon you or give up on us or give up on you when his love surpasses the love of your, your, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, or whoever? God's love surpasses that. So never believe or never think that God will ever abandon us or leave us. Never lose hope. For God wants to dwell with us. 
Now, the high priest. Going back to this concept of the high priest. God, of course, did not abandon us. And we know that through the working of the Holy Spirit um, that, yeah, Jesus. Jesus is, is our high priest. But uh, what is, again, the role of the high priest? Well, back in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, it tells us, But only the high priest ever entered the holy, most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people he had committed in ignorance. Now, one of the many functions of the high priest, of course, is to enter into, of course, the most holy compartment, most holy place uh, in the sanctuary. And it is there that, um, yeah, I guess like it is there that we, well, let me kind of explain what the, 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 this particular object is here. Because here, of course, inside, well, we have a little box. We have what we call the Ark of the Covenant, for those that don't know. And inside the Ark of the Covenant has the Ten Commandments, um, Aaron's rod, and the pot of manna. Now, now, the particular feature I'd probably like to point out was the, the Ten Commandments itself, which kind of represents God's kind of foundation for His throne. Um, above that, we've got the two covering cherubs, which, uh, uh, which are two on each side. And then in the middle of that, we've got what we call the, the mercy seat. And that's where God sits and governs. So the earthly high priest would go before God in the most holy place, and there he will intercede before um, he will intercede for the children of Israel uh, for their sins. And they, uh, and they of course, from there, uh, the children of Israel will be, um, while, the, while the high priest is there, the children of Israel will try to amend their ways, make things right with God. They will, be, they will afflict their souls, you know, thinking, oh, God, I know I did something very horrible. I know I did something very horrible with, with, um, with someone. And, and that's another thing is also, during that time, while they're amending their ways, they're amending their ways with other people. So while they, um, uh, uh, during this particular period of time, while the high priest is there, they will go to their brother or sister they've committed, um, they've, they've wronged, and they will seek forgiveness. And it's something that we also need to realize for ourselves. As Christ is right there in heaven, that we too need to amend our ways with each other. I know, I know we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're all individuals. And I know that sometimes we could be, we can irk someone. And um, it is time for us to make things right, especially in these times. Christ is coming. Jesus is coming. And, it, you know, if we're not right with our brothers, then we need to be right with our brothers. We need to make, that, uh, make those changes, changes so we can be so we can be made right with God. We need to make right with each other. And here we kind of have a complete picture of what uh, Jesus is doing. He is interceding for us right now in heaven. He's making things right with us and Him. But we need to do something first, and we need to make ourselves right with each other. And to surmise what we have just gone through, there is a heavenly sanctuary, and there is a high priest, and His name is Jesus. He is our brethren, and he is there interceding on our behalf. And yes, he died for our sins on the cross, but his blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And through faith, we have remission of sins. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 15, it tells us, Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a, of a heifer could cleanse people's, people's bodies from the ceremony, the ceremonial impurity. Just think of how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and the people. So that all who are called receive, and, uh, receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins, so that uh, so they had committed under uh, uh, penalty of sins that they had committed under the first covenant. And it tells us that Jesus still is working. He has that work, and it's something that we call the, of course, as Adventists, what we call the investigative judgment. Remember when we read how the high priest will enter into the most holy place? We believe Jesus is also in the most holy place in heaven, performing the duties of the high priest. Now, when we think about the sanctuary, what it represents, as I said before, 
It, is, um, it represents the ministry of Jesus on earth as well as what Jesus is doing right now. It all points to Christ. And uh, as we contemplate us as Christians, you know, when we contemplate uh, this whole thing, are we not to... I'm thinking about how we should abide in Christ and how we can abide in His... Um, well, we are to abide in Christ. I'm thinking about uh, John chapter 15, verse uh, 5. Um, that He is the vine that, and we are the branches. And that it, he that abides in me, and I in him, beareth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And that is totally true. Without him, we can do nothing. And the sanctuary is a place for us where humanity is able to come close to God. God wasn't only there for blood sacrifices. God was not there just to watch people just crucify, uh, or not crucify, um, sacrifice animals. No. God wants to be personal with them. But the only way that God can be personal with them is that, yeah, if in, uh, God, yeah, the only way God can be personal with them is that uh, the sin was blotted out. And that's how God can be personal with us. The sacrifice that the children of Israel were offering at that time was meant to be a message to them, to help them realize what sin does and who it was meant to point to. But as time progressed, that whole concept of sacrifice and just became a habit to them. It became a, yeah, it just became routine. So the children of Israel, all they did was, oh, I sinned? Okay, I can just go back to just bring my sacrifice and I'll be made right with God. All will be good. All will be well. But unfortunately, the, this, is what not, this is not what God wanted for them. And Jesus came to end all, the, all this senseless killing and become the, the ultimate sacrifice for all of humanity. And through, the, and through His blood and through faith in Him, we can have access to that throne. We can have access to this, to the most holy place, through Him, in His blood. But in order for us to have that, Jesus needs to become our bridge. Je Jesus needs to become our bridge to our heaven, Heavenly Father. And we must abide in Him. Now, there are two types I like to think of this. There are two types um, that we can have this, um, this connection with God. And, um, yeah. and, I, and I think about, I was, reading, I was reading the book of Ezekiel. I know you guys were going through Jeremiah, uh, but I've been going through the book of Ezekiel. And there's a place here in Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 24 to 28. And it says, yeah, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall, have all, um, they shall, have, they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgment, observe my statutes, and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your father dwelt, and they shall dwell there. They, their children, their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will seek my sanctuary in the midst forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations, shall, um, the nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel, my sanctuary in, the midst forever, uh, in, in their midst forever. Now, when I think about this verse, when I read this particular verse, it, it made me think, is Jesus or is God talking something that was to be in the present or something in the, in the future? Like, when I meant present, like now. Is God talking to, the, um, to us presently or something that will happen in the future? What are your thoughts? Who, hands up for present. Who thinks that this is something more, like, more present? Who's something that it's more future? Yes, you jumped the gun. You jumped the gun, Andrew. You did jump the gun. Uh, it is something that is more for both, yeah. Both present and something that is future. In fact, when I look at... Um, when I, think of, when I look at Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27, this, this particular verse, uh, I'll read that again. It says, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. There's a verse in the New Testament that kind of makes me, kind of reminded me of something. And it's found in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 to, uh, 3 to 4. And it says, yeah, I heard an angel, oh, sorry, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle of God is with men, 
and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So I'll, I'll look at that verse in Revelation 21, verse 3, and also what you find in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27, and I see how it's linked. It's a future thing, something that is to happen in the future, but at the same time, it's something that is happening now. Something that is ongoing, a process. And when I look at the, the, the concept of the, uh, the sanctuary, I see that as well. But before I talk about that, I like, to think about, I like to talk about the fact that it's saying here, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now, what is that tabernacle? What is a tabernacle? The word tabernacle is another, it's a, it's a uh, Latin name for tent, which the children of Israel made while they were in the wilderness. So this tent, this, this, this is what we call the tabernacle. Together it's a whole sanctuary, but this particular part here is the tabernacle. And I think about what it says there in verse 27 of Ezekiel 37. It says here, um, my tabernacle also will, uh, shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. In verse 28, the nations also no, will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel, my sanctuary, is in their midst forever. God's sanctuary is in their midst forever. Where is God's sanctuary? What does it mean? Let's elaborate that. What is, is, this, is this God's sanctuary? Is this church God's sanctuary? Can we limit God to a building? You know, I think about um, the Mormons. The Mormons like to call their, their churches temples. Uh, and I think there are, oh, no, yeah, temples as well as tabernacle is what the Mormons would like to call them. Can we fit God in a box? Can we fit God in a book? I think about, uh, I think about us as a people, us as a congregation, especially those who are at home watching. And I find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, it says, yeah, do you realize that all of you together are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God lives in you. God will destroy anyone who destroys the te this temple. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. What are we? Yeah. We are the temple of God. All of us. Does that mean we should... I mean, I'm not asking you guys saying that, you know, um, that we are holy or anything like that. Um, and there's something I was going to uh, show to you later on about our, our journey... But together, we are God's temple because the Spirit of God dwells in us. It dwells amongst us. And again, whether you're online, at home, or wherever you are, we are all together in the body of Christ. Together, we represent God's sanctuary and a place for sinners and those who are rejected by society. We are here to lead these people to Christ, to our Redeemer, to our friend, to Jesus, our King and High Priest. We are God's sanctuary. We are God's temple. And the temple, um, yeah, we, we, are, we are kind of like the um, conduit, so to say, uh, for, for God and for humanity. Because God, God well, we are, of course, we represent the body of Christ and God's spirit dwells amongst us. We abide in Christ. So how we need to think about how we reflect ourselves in our community as individuals, as a church, how do we reflect the image of Christ? How do we reflect the image of Christ? You know, and um, yeah, is God truly abiding in us? Is the Holy Spirit working in us in revealing God's plan for salvation? And when we look again, again, when we look at again with the, uh, the whole concept of the sanctuary, I talked about yeah, God's plan for salvation. And I know some of us may know this, but for those who don't, when we look at the Christian journey, who we are, all right, we are, for most of us, uh, well, let's start from the beginning. For someone who was new to Christianity, what do they do? What happens to the person that is new to Christianity? What, uh, how do they make themselves right with God? Yeah, that's true, yes. They, you know, they need to be justified, right? And in order for them to be justified, they need to make, of course, make their journey. They need to make their journey. But before they make their journey, they've got to go through the door. Of course, the, the first thing, 
Jesus is our door, all right? Jesus is the door, and that's found in uh, uh, John chapter 13, if I'm right. John chapter 13. And it is here they accept Christ as their sacrifice. They accept his blood, and it is here they, yeah, they accept what Jesus has done for them. And, of course, from here they are baptized. They are baptized. And from here, this is their journey. And it is here that they are justified. So the sinner accepts the, um, Christ as, as his redeemer. And um, the sinner, of course, accepts Christ um, as his sacrifice. And of course, he's redeemed. He is baptized, uh, whether by the Holy Spirit or by water. And it is here they make the next part in their journey. And it is here is what we call sanctification. Oh, sanctify. I'm just going to make it easy. I don't have to bother to write this so much, so, uh, a lot. But anyway, here we find that they are being sanctified. And here we have, of course, the menorah. The menorah represents, um, uh, the menorah represents Jesus being a light to the world. Um, here we also find um, uh, the showbread as well, which represents um, the Word of God. Um, and also here we, also, we have the, the table the altar of incense, which represents prayer. And it is here for us as Christians. Are we here at this present time? Are we being sanctified? Are we, me, are we being made holy? Um, are we taking of the word of God, the bread, um, yeah, the bread of life? Are we being a light to our world? Are we actively in prayer? Okay, we, can be, we can pray at church, but are we praying constantly? Are we praying to our Father? Now this is the next part of our journey for many of us. And this is where we are glorified. Okay. But here, this is when Christ will return. And this is what we're all looking forward to. This is something that we all want to be in. But we can only be here once Christ has finished his job. All right. But for the meantime, this is where we are at at this present time. This is our journey. However, are we actively involved in the sanctuary. Now what I mean, what do I mean by actively involved in the sanctuary? What does that all mean? Well, I'm going to take us to another verse. And it's found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Oh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and it tells us here, but you are not like that, for you're, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. What does Paul, oh, sorry, not Paul, what does Peter say who we are? We are what? We, yeah, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Now, when I talked about this whole concept about the, the roles of the sanctuary, we talked about the sinner, but I also talked about the priests. And there, what the priest would have to do was to be in service of all this. And obviously the job, the main role was in here, in the most holy, uh, in, sorry, not most holy place, in the holy place. If we're to be priests, how involved are we in our role here? Are we actively involved in this? Are we part-time priests? Should we be part-time priests? Or are we full-time priests? If we're full-time priests, how actively are we involved in studying God's Word, in reading His Bible? How actively are, are we involved in being a light to the world? All right. How actively are we involved in prayer? How actively are, are we involved in being led by His Holy Spirit? So, if we are there for the if we are therefore a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession, how actively are you involved in God's sanctuary, in abiding in Him? And the purpose for this, this point right here is to help us to be made holy, to help us to abide in Him, to have that connection, that relationship with Him. But we need to perform that role, that priesthood role, are we leading people to his sanctuary? Are we leading people to Jesus? Day in, day out. 
Are we leading them to know the, the joy of knowing who He is, the peace that we can find in Him? Christmas is just around the corner. Now, of course, for most of us, we know that Christmas is just a, well, we know what Christmas all, is all about. But at least it points, it kind of helps us to remind us who Jesus is and why He came to this world. And that is something that we can share to, to this world. We don't have to go in detail and say, oh, this is a pagan day, etc. But we can talk about that Jesus is, uh, why He came to this world. He came to this world to save us, to be that bridge, to save humanity. And that it is through God's plan of salvation we can, we can, we can share to them who God really is. That God came to this world to dwell with us, to spend time with us, to be who we are and did not sin. To die for us and to represent us in heaven. In this sanctuary, there's still, of course, work in these times. There's still work for Christ. There's still work for us. There's still a people that, need to be, that needs to be prepared. Christ is coming soon. Christ will soon finish His work there in the most holy place and will come to take us. There's a time for us to, there's a time for us to, well, there's a time for everything, of course. But the time for us to abide in Christ is now. Thank you, John. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so, I want us to realize that the time now for us to abide in Christ is now. Will you abide in, would you abide in His sanctuary? Will you abide with Him? Amen. Do I need to pray? Okay. All right. I was hoping that we're going to do another closing sing song, but okay. Fair enough. All right. Let's pray. Our dear, loving Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we'd just like to thank you for this message. And I know that the, the sanctuary can be a, a full-on full on conversation. It's a, it's a big topic. And I know there were some times I was tempted and just going further and just going off my notes. But Lord, I know that uh, there, as we look to the sanctuary, yes, it is something that we should study, that we should look to. And we know and we thank you, Lord God, for being, you know, just coming to this world and being our representative just, and dying for our sins. Lord, as we look to this and, and look at the reasons why you came to this world, you know, you created so much. When we look at, to the stars and to the, to the other galaxies, there is so much out there that you could have died for, but you just came for us. And the Father in heaven, even though we've rebelled, that we've done so... Um, many wrong things to you. We thank you, Father in heaven, for your sacrifice and what you're doing for us. And Lord, as we look to that sacrifice, we pray that you'll help us to represent you on this earth as Christians, as followers of Christ. Help us, Father in heaven, to be that light, to be that example. Help us, Lord, Father in heaven, to lead people, Lord, to your sanctuary, a dwelling place of refuge. We thank you all this in the name of Christ Jesus, we're the Lord and Savior. Amen.